So last time we were talking about geometric series. Just let me remind you about them quickly and we'll do a couple of examples. Here is the general idea. Geometric series looks like this. Very generally, it's the sum of some a times r to the n, where r is your ratio. So if we write this out, and you can start really anywhere. We often start at zero or one. So if we write the sum from n equals zero to infinity of a times r to the n, that's just going to be a times r to the zero plus a times r to the one plus a times r squared, and so on and so on and so on. And this is going to converge to the first term, which is a over one minus the ratio, if well, it has to be true. The ratio has to be between negative one and one, or the absolute value of the ratio has to be less than one. And then I don't know if you just said the next thing I would say, but I definitely think it's worthwhile. This is a nice formula and all, but there's a better formula. And the better formula is the sum from n equals wherever the n equals k to infinity of a times r to the n, it's just going to be the first term of your series divided by one minus your ratio. So in this particular place where I've chosen to start at n equals k, it would end up being a times r to the k for one minus r. Very, very general. So for example, the sum from n equals three to infinity of, let's make it interesting here, sure. Four times three to the n plus one over five to the n. So there's a couple ways you can go about doing this. You might just start writing out terms, you might not. But really, we have to just figure out a couple things. We have to figure out, well, one, is it even geometric? Two, if it is geometric, what's the ratio? And then finally, if that ratio is between negative one and one, does what does it converge to? So here's how you can find the ratio in two different ways. The first way, which is actually really kind of easy, is just start writing out some terms. The first term is going to be four times three to the fourth or five to the third. The next term is going to be, well, if I plug in n equal to four, four times three to the fifth over five to the fourth. The next term is going to be four times three to the sixth or five to the fifth. Sorry, that's a five to the fifth, not a five times five. Apologies. I know it looks like five times five because I wrote it that way. But five to the fifth. Sorry, one more term just so they don't look terrible. If n equals six, you're going to get four times three to the seventh over five to the sixth. And now the question is, do we multiply by the same ratio every time to get from one term to the next term? And the answer here is yes. If I multiply this by three on top and five on the bottom, I get the next term. And that's true from here to here or from here to here. If I multiply by three fifths, three to the fifth times three is three to the sixth, and five to the fourth times five is five to the fifth. So every time we are multiplying by three fifths. So here our ratio is equal to three fifths. I kind of like doing it that way. It feels very kind of, I don't know, just rudimentary. Like you just write the thing out and then you ask yourself, is the thing, is the next thing the same multiple as the other thing? You can even do this more algorithmically by literally dividing this by that. It's kind of annoying, but it'll work out. If you divide this by that, you'll get three fifths. If you divide this by that, you'll get three fifths. If you divide this by that, you'll get three fifths. The other way is to try to rewrite this so you've got something at least to the end power. So I could rewrite this as the sum of n equals three to infinity of four times three times three to the n over five to the n. So three to the n plus one is three plus three to the n. And then we can break that apart as four times three is 12 and the three to the n over five to the n is the same as three fifths to the n. So that makes it clear to me here that, oh yeah, this is also 
still a geometric series. And yes, the ratio is three fifths because we got three fifths here at the end. How did I do that? Good question. So what I did was I saw that three to the n plus one, that plus one is not very helpful. So I broke that three to the n plus one apart as three to the n times three to the first. And then I saw the four there and the five to the n. And then this part here became 12 and three to the n over five to the n is the same as three over five to the n. So either way we see that we get this. And now I can write out what it adds up to because it's a, it's a geometric series and my ratio is less than one. I should say the absolute value of my ratio. Or if you prefer, you can take the two. So then what does my series add up to? Well, here's another advantage of doing it the first way. You do it the first way, you've literally written what your first term is. It's gross, but it's four times three to the fourth over five to the third. So this is going to add up to four times three to the fourth over five to the third divided by one minus my ratio. Again, nobody's favorite number, but it is the right answer. Can we make this look nicer? Yeah, a little bit. I would probably leave it like this if I didn't need to make it look nicer. If we're going to make it look nicer, I would say that it's four times three to the fourth over five to the third. And this being divided by two fifths, let's multiply it by the reciprocal, which is five halves. Then the four and the two can cancel and give me a two on top. And the five there can cancel with one of the fives there. So I end up with two times three to the fourth over five squared. Three to the fourth is 81 times two is 162 over 25. Yeah, question. It's not so it's not five halves, it's five squared. Right. And that's coming from the fact that I have a five on top and a five cubed on the bottom. So I'm canceling out one of the fives on top and one of the fives on the bottom. Oh, sure, sure. Oh, yeah, sure. So I uh, yeah, yeah. So one minus three fifths is two fifths, and then I flipped and multiplied by the reciprocal two fifths. Sorry, I thought you were saying something else completely. Again. If it were me on an exam, I would leave it like this. And if I was expected to simplify it, I would still leave it like this. And then I'd come back later if I had time. Let me give you all one to try. So why don't you determine whether or not this series, the sum of n equals c to infinity of six times, I don't even know why I would print this here. Anyway. 7 to the n over, I won't make it too hard yet, 5 times 8 to the n plus 3. Determine whether or not that converges, if it converges, what it converges to. Don't feel like you need to simplify what it converges to if it converges.
And what do we think? Converge or diverge? Do you converge to? Okay, so think my ratio is seven eighths. You can kind of, when you have like a something to the n plus or minus some stuff, the plus or minus doesn't really affect the ratio. So we can kind of look at this and see that we have a seven to the n over eight, which becomes a seven eighths to the n. If you really wanted to, you could certainly rewrite this as the sum from n equals two to infinity of six times seven to the n over five times eight cubed times eight to the n. And then one more rewriting just to help us identify the ratio. That's going to be six over five times eight cubed times seven eighths to the nth power. Which definitely means this is going to converge. Because our ratio is seven eighths. And that's definitely less than one and bigger than negative one. Yeah. Like able to like plug in the n into like the eight and then just add eight and three, like the three and the two. Like also, but to, to to accomplish what? I think because I guess he's like I was a bit confused trying to do this one. So, I so you did you write it the other way? Yeah. You, so yeah, that totally works too. So we can also write out terms. So like my first term would be six times seven squared over five times eight to the fifth. And then my next term would be six times seven cubed over five times eight to the sixth. And we can see that the only thing that's really changing is the power of seven and eight are both increasing by one each time. The next one's gonna be six times seven to the fourth divided by five times eight to the seventh. And if you really want, so you could even do this in kind of the weird way that I talked about, instead of saying, I, it's obvious I'm multiplying by seven eighths here. So this is, you could actually take this term and divide it by that term. So if you take, six times seven cubed over five times eight to the sixth and divided by six times seven squared over five times eight to the fifth, even though it looks pretty gross, it will still get you where you want to be. I'm going to flip and multiply and say that's going to be five times eight to the fifth over six times seven squared. The sixes cancel, the fives cancel, you're left with seven cubed times eight to the fifth over seven squared times eight to the sixth. The seven cubed over seven squared is just seven and eight to the fifth over eight to the sixth gives you an eight in the bottom. Another way you could get there if you decided to. The only thing you have to, if you're doing it that way though, you do have to kind of recognize that each term has the same ratio, right? It definitely doesn't work if it's not a geometric series. And I'll show you that example in a minute or two. Um, and then what does this converge to? Well, we have the sum from n equals two to infinity of six times seven to the n over five times eight to the n plus three. That's just gonna be the first term, which is six times seven squared over five times eight to the fifth over one minus seven eighths. It's always the first term divided by one minus the ratio or the sum of a geometric series. And if, if a series diverges, no, typically not, right? So, so, so Ryan asked, if a series diverges, will we have to show where the geometric series diverges to? And the answer usually is no. Sometimes in web work specifically, which I know you aren't doing this class, but sometimes in web work, they will ask if the series diverges to infinity or negative infinity, or just doesn't exist because you don't have an answer. But most of the time, you're not going to be asked what, what kind of divergence you have just if it diverges. Um, but the only, op, the only real answers for where a series diverges to is either infinity or negative infinity or just that the limit doesn't exist. Um, I guess we could simplify this. This is 6 times 7 squared over 5 times 8 to the fifth. Dividing by 1 eighth is like multiplying by 8 over 1. So you can cancel an 8 here and an 8 here and get six times seven squared over five times eight to the fourth. And I would not do any other work there. What about this next one? Let's say I was asked about the sum from n equals one to infinity of two to the two n plus three over three to the n minus five. 
and let's go both ways. So I can start writing out terms. My first term is two to the, let's see, two plus three is five. One minus five is negative four. The next term is gonna be when I plug in n equals two, it comes to is four plus three is seven. And let's see, n equals two, I get three to the two minus five is three to the negative three. And keep going. The next one's two to the ninth over three to the minus two, two to the eleventh over three to the minus one, two to the thirteenth over three to the minus three to the zero, two to the fifteenth over three to the one, and so on and so on and so on. So every term, from here to here, I'm multiplying the top by what? Right, and the bottom by three to the, well, yeah, three. I was gonna say three to the first, but three is also correct. <laughs> and that is equal to four thirds, which is bigger than one. So this series diverges. Alternatively, if you wanted to do it the other way, by trying to figure out what you have raised to the nth power, we could rewrite this series as the sum n equals one to infinity. I'm going to write this as two to the third times two to the two n over three to the negative fifth times three to the n. And then I would probably rewrite this part as two to the third times three to the positive fifth, just so I don't have to write a negative power. That part's not the part that really matters, though. Two to the two n over three to the n is the same as two squared to the n over three to the n, which is really going to be four to the n over three to the n, or four thirds to the n. And then we can say, oh yeah, just like the other example, or the other way of doing this, our ratio is four thirds. Four thirds is bigger than one, so we get divergence. Sometimes it can be a little tricky like that, where you might have thought at the beginning your ratio was going to be two thirds because we weren't, if we weren't looking super carefully here. Um, yeah. Are like both, both ways viable for like any situation? Only for geometric series. This is only a valid method for if your series is geometric. So let me give you an example of what I mean. Let's say we have the sum from n equals two to infinity n squared over three to the n. If I start writing out terms, it's gonna be, let's see, two squared over three squared plus two, sorry, three squared over three cubed plus four squared over three to the fourth plus five squared over three to the fifth and so on and so on and so on. Is this geometric? Let's check and see. What do I multiply by this to get that? Well, this is this is an example where the doing the division actually really helps. And I know, sorry, that three looks a little terrible there. That's a three squared. Wow, that made that did not look better, James. Let's, let's write this again, just so it doesn't look so gross. Yeah, that's a little bit better. So if I do say my second term divided by my first term three squared over three to the third divided by two squared over three squared. That's also just gross, but it's fine. We can flip and multiply. Um, let's reduce this. Three squared over three cubed is just one third. That's one third on top divided by two squared over three squared or multiplied by three squared over two squared. So that looks like, cancel a three there and a three there, three over four. So the first term times three fourths is equal to the second term. If I multiply this term by three fourths, I'm not going to get that. Let me show you. So I'll just point out two squared over three squared times three fourths is equal to three over three squared, which is three squared over three cubed. So this times three fourths is that. But then if I multiply this by three fourths, three squared over three cubed times three fourths is gonna give me three to the third over four times three to the third, which is really just one fourth. 
And that is definitely not the next term in the sequence, which is four squared over three to the fourth. Those are not the same. Four squared over three to the fourth is like 16 over 81. And it's definitely not one to four. So the point is, this series is not geometric because you're not multiplying by the same ratio each time to get from one term to the next term. So this is not geometric. And really the way we can identify this more easily is that you don't just have the usual form, which is some constant times some ratio to the nth power. And initially, in, in addition to having one over three to the n or one third to the n, there's also an n squared there. And that n squared is not a hallmark of being geometric. If you have a, an n that is not like the exponent, if you have something where it's not just something raised to the nth power, not geometric. So what does that mean for us if it's not geometric? Well, we definitely can't use these tools we've just talked about. We have to develop other tools to talk about whether or not this series converges or diverges. A couple things. Thing one. Well, let me ask you all a question. Did your teacher mention telescoping series? Telescoping sums? He probably didn't, but I just want to double check. Okay. If he does, let me know, because we'll talk about it more in depth. But for the most part, the only type of series we are able to actually find the value that the series converges to is a geometric series. Any other series we talk about later on that converges, we almost never actually know what it converges to. So for example, this series, I will tell you, does converge. We don't yet have the tools to see how it converges, but we will get there. So this is convergence. We'll talk about why, we'll probably get there today. Um, yeah, so yeah, we should talk about that, okay. This class is always so weird because you talk about a bunch of tests, but like you kind of don't, we kind of don't talk about all the background behind it. So we did talk about on Monday, the fact that this series, sum of one over N is divergent. Kind of a big deal. Um, it's called the harmonic series. And I will point out to you, well, I will tell you actually, that if you look at the sum from n equals one to infinity of one over n squared, which is one plus a fourth plus a ninth plus a sixteenth, and so on and so on and so on, that is convergent. Don't worry, we're going to talk about why in a minute here. You're not expected to know what this converges to, but I will tell you anyway, because it's neat. This converges to pi squared divided by six. And there are some funky ways of showing it. Again, you don't need to know that. I'm just telling you because it's neat. Later on, your teacher is definitely probably gonna ask you if this series converges. He's almost decidedly not going to ask you what it converges to. So yeah, let's do this. So here's another way of showing. Oh, do I really want to get into all that? I just don't know how you're supposed to know. I don't know. So I don't know how you're supposed to know this without the following test. So I'm going to show you a test, even though you might not learn it in your actual class, such as life. Let me just show you some pictures, actually. Let's do it this way. Let's make our lives a little bit easier. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to look at the integral, and it's been a while from one to infinity of one over x squared. We're gonna look at that for just a minute. So let's see, if we look at this integral, we use a limit, and it's been a while since you've done improper integrals, but they definitely were something we covered in 16b, right? I think, sorry, I was, I was always like, I know we do that in most classes. So integral from one to e, of one over x squared dx, the integral of x to the negative two, x to the negative one over negative one, or as I would prefer to write it, negative one over x, from one to b, we still have a limit out here in front, 
you plug in B with the limit as B goes to infinity, negative one over B minus negative one over one, that goes to zero and zero minus minus one is one. So what I want to point out here is this interval converges. It converges to one. And that would be true for any other higher power of X as well. Right, if it was one over X cubed, one over X to the fourth, one over X to the fifth, it wouldn't matter, you'd still get convergence. All right, let me do one more, just to just kind of ease your mind here. You don't really need to write this down if you don't want to, you certainly can't. If I did the interval from like one to infinity of one over X to the fifth, I'm gonna get the same result. It's equal to the limit, B goes to infinity, interval from one to B, let's write it as X to the negative fifth. You integrate it, you get x to the negative fourth over negative four from one to b. I would probably rewrite that as negative one over four x to the fourth. And then we plug in, we get the limit, if b goes to infinity, of negative one over four b to the fourth minus negative one over four times one to the fourth. That goes to zero, and you get plus one fourth. But the only point I really want you to see here is that both of these intervals converge. And they converge to a value. Doesn't really matter what the value is, actually. Here's what I want to show you now, though. Check this out. I'm going to draw a picture that I think is going to be helpful. Let's make sure I draw the right picture. Whoops. Wow. Let me pick the right one. I want that picture. Cool. Okay. So. Here's my function f of x equal to one over x squared. You can also pretend it's one over x to the fifth, or really any function one over x to a positive integer power. All right, so now let's look at what happens at these points here. Specifically, I want this here. How much area is in that rectangle? What's the base of that rectangle? What's the height of that rectangle? I mean, I know it's not drawn to scale. Mm, it's a little higher than one, or sorry, a little lower than one. I'm not plugging in one to get the height, I'm plugging in, but, I, but what's my X though? It's two. So here, right, this point here is the point two comma one fourth. So this area of this rectangle is one times one fourth. Okay, what about the next rectangle over here? How much area does that rectangle have? You all know it, you just don't want to say it. One ninth, thank you so much. How about the next one? Oh, base. right, the base is still one. Okay, and then the next one's 125th, and so on and so on and so on. So here's what I want to show you. I want you to see all of these areas here, 1 4th plus 1 9th plus 1 16th plus 1 25th, plus so on and so on and so on, forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. That's going to be less than the area under the curve. Seems reasonable, right? Those rectangles literally have less area than the area under the curve. We're missing these little bits here and here and here and here and so on. Okay, so all these numbers added together is less than the integral from one to infinity of one over x squared, which we just showed was equal to one. And now I'm going to add one to both sides because I want all the terms in my series. So now I'm going to say that one plus one fourth plus one ninth plus one sixteenth plus one twenty fifth, and so on and so on and so on, is less than one plus one. I just added one to both sides. Okay, but here's what I really got. My series from n equals one to infinity of one over n squared is less than two. 
Now there's a little bit more theory that I'm that I'm not going to explain here, but here's the basic idea. If your series is less than some integral that converges, your series also converges. So this series from one of one over n squared is converging. It doesn't converge to two. We actually know it converges to pi squared over six. But if the integral is convergent, the series is also convergent. So here's the end result of this. This means that it's actually true that this series from n equals one to infinity of one over n to any power that is greater than one is converging. So this P series, as it's often called, is convergent if P is strictly greater than one and is divergent if P is less than or equal to one. I would encourage you to memorize this because it comes up a lot. Usually, these kinds of series are the examples we kind of default to when we're trying to compare, and there is something called the comparison test, our series that we want to know about its convergence versus a series of vacuum. So just a couple quick examples. Some from n equals one to infinity of one over n cubed converges because P is bigger than one. P is the power, right? I should really write because P is equal to three is bigger than one. Okay. What about the sum from N equals one to infinity of one over the square root of N? What's my power now? Right. So I've got one over N to the one half. One half is less than or equal to one. So this diverges because P equal to one half is less than or equal to one. It's a little silly if your power is negative. Here's why. If I said the sum from N equals one to infinity of say like one over N to the negative second. Well, sure, you could say it diverges because it's a P series and your P is less than or equal to one. But also, you could just rewrite this. Okay, this is the sum from n equals one to infinity of n squared. And that diverges by the nth term test. Because the limit of our sequence is not zero. And that's usually what people appeal to in that power. But it's kind of, you could also say it diverges. So to be super specific here, a P series is a P series, it's a series that looks exactly like this. It goes from n equals one to infinity, it's exactly one over n to the P. Sometimes you'll get a little bit touchy about this because, because for example, I would say if I had like the sum from say n equals three to infinity of one over n to the fourth. Technically, it's not a P series because you're not starting n equals one. But literally, you have less terms. So if the thing that has more terms converges, so I, I know for sure sum from n equals three to infinity, sorry, n equals one to infinity of one over n to the fourth is one plus one over 16 plus one over 81 plus one over whatever four to the fourth is. This definitely converges. To what? I don't know. This series up here, which is missing the first two terms, well, if you take something that adds up to a finite amount, that's what it means when we say a series is convergent, right? That series, one over n to the fourth, I don't know what it adds up to, but I definitely am 100% sure it adds up to something that is a finite real number. You take that finite real number and subtract one and one over two to the fourth from it, still adding up to a finite number. So this series, which is one over three to the fourth plus one over four to the fourth plus one over five to the fourth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, 
is also convergence. And in fact, I'm going to make kind of a blanket statement here. If you take any series and you know whether it's convergent or divergent, you can add or subtract as many terms as a finite number of terms to it, and it still converges or diverges as it did before. So, for example, I also know, like we just said, let's do this one the sum from n equals one to infinity of one over the square root of n diverges. Right? It adds up to, well, if they're all positive terms, it's typically adding up to infinity. But usually, if all your terms are positive, it's diverging to infinity. Okay, I could subtract off as many terms as I want, and it would still diverge, right? If I take away a finite amount from an infinite amount, I'm still left with infinity. I could subtract off the first billion terms, right? I could say the sum from n equals, let's say a million, because it's easier to write it there. From n equals 1 million to infinity, 1 over the square root of n still diverges. Because all you've done is subtracted off a lot, right? One plus one over root two plus one over root three plus one over root four plus one all the way to one over root a million. But then the rest of those terms that are left still have to add up to infinity. Start with infinity, take away a finite amount, you still have infinity. So Infinity minus a finite number, still infinity. A finite number minus a finite number, still finite. So the result here is that once you know a series converges, you can add or subtract any amount of terms to it you want, and it'll still converge. Once you know a series diverges, you can add or subtract any amount of terms that you want, and it still diverges. Cool. Okay, so where are we going with this? Well, the reason it's nice to know whether or not these p-series converge or diverge is because then we like to ask about something like, what about the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n cubed plus 2? Hmm. That looks like 1 over 1 plus 2 plus 1 over 2 cubed plus 2 plus one over three cubed plus two, and so on and so on and so on. Well, I'm gonna compare this to something that's very similar. Let's compare it to the sum of one over n cubed, n equals one to infinity, which we all happen to know has what kind of behavior? Is this series here convergent or divergent? You can give me a thumbs up if you think it's a thumbs down if you think it's average. So this is definitely a convergent series. And it converges because it's a, conver it's a convergent p-series, and our p-value is what? And three, and three is bigger than one, and it converges when p is bigger than one. The way I kind of think about this is your p-value has to be large enough so that your terms get small fast enough. Right? We are adding up an infinite number of terms. And the only way that those infinite number of terms can add to something that is finite is if they get really small, really fast. One over n doesn't get small fast enough. Right? One plus one half plus one third plus one fourth plus one fifth and so on and so on and so on. Doesn't, the terms don't get small fast enough. Those terms all add up to infinity. Which we did talk about last time. We talked about how you can group like the first two and then four and then eight and then 16 and see if they get that. You can also compare it to something. So what we're gonna do is say, well, look, this is one plus one over two cubed plus one over three cubed and so on and so on. And look at this, this term here, one over one plus two is definitely less than one. And this term here, one over two cubed plus two is definitely less than one over two cubed. If your denominator is larger, your fraction is. So this larger denominator than that denominator means that fraction is smaller. So this is less than that. This is less than that. 
is less than that, or more generally, one over n cubed plus two is always less than one over n cubed. But if all of these terms add up to some finite number, then all of these slightly lesser terms that are still positive also add up here. So what we can say is because one over n cubed plus two is less than one over n cubed, that means the sum from n equals one to infinity of one over n cubed plus two is less than the sum from n equals one to infinity of one over n cubed. And since this converges, that means this has to converge. Which is the idea behind what's called the direct comparison test, which I'll write down right now. So the direct comparison test says the following. Well, it says half of the direct comparison test says the following. I'll write the other half in a second. The direct comparison test says two things. One of the things is the following. If your sequence of, so, yeah, sure. If an is less than bn, and also your terms are positive or really non negative. So if your sequence an is less than bn, and we know that the series for bn converges, well, if we are if your sequence is less than the sequence of a convergent series, then we can say the sum of an from n is also convergent. Or in other words, if your series is smaller than the convergent series, it's also convergent. On the flip side, I bet you might be able to guess what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. If our series is bigger than some other series, I should say, if the sequence of our series is bigger than the sequence of some other series, and the known series that we are bigger than diverges, I'm um, sorry, I should have written greater than zero here, of course. These are, these, both of these are under the assumption that all the terms of your series are all positive. They're not all negative, they're not alternating, they're just all positive. But if your series diverge, if the known series diverges and your series is bigger than the divergent series, then it also diverges. Question. Good question. So the way I, when I'm reading this, we're written as this, and people will sometimes write it slightly differently. I'm reading this as the sum of Bn is the known series, and the sum of An is the one we are trying to figure out. So in the previous example, an was one over n cubed plus two and bn was one over n cubed. Because we know because it's a P series that the sum of one over n cubed converges. And then this sequence, one over n cubed plus two always being less than that sequence and this series converging shows that that series converges. Let me show you another example that's, that's kind of nice. Let's say we have, oh yeah, do we have the time? Yeah, we do. Let's say I had this series, the sum from of natural log of n over n from n equals, I don't want to start at, I guess I could start it. No, I'll start at three. Converge or diverge? Well, I'm pretty sure it diverges. And that's actually an important aspect of the direct comparison test you kind of have to start the problem off with thinking, I think it diverges, or I think it converges. Because once you have an idea of what happens, then your job is to compare it to something that you know does the thing that you want it to do. So here, since I think this diverges, I'm going to compare it to something I know that. And the usual first choice is one over n. That's kind of your go-to choice of a series that is diverging. 
So note that the natural log of n over n is bigger than one over n, as long as n is bigger than or equal to e. And it is because we're starting at n equals three, which is bigger. So the natural log of n is bigger than one over n, which means the sum from n equals three to infinity of the natural log of n over n is bigger than the sum from n equals three to infinity of one over n. And we know that this diverges because we know that the p-series from n equals one to infinity of one over n diverges. If you take a divergent series and subtract off the first two terms, it's still going to diverge. So then, since this series is bigger than some divergent series, we can say that it must diverge. Sum from n equals three to infinity of the natural log of n over n must diverge. Cool. Let's look at one more example. We got time for one more? Yeah, here. Let's go back to n squared over three to the n. Which I said converged. And I'm pretty sure it does. So I want to compare it to something I know converges, which is kind of tricky. But here's something, hmm, hmm. Let's see, I need to pick something that n squared is less than to make this work. So I would really like to say that this is just less than one over three to the n, because I know that the sum of one over three to the n converges, but it's not, right? n squared isn't less than one. n is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. This is where the direct comparison test gets challenging to use. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick. Ooh, yeah, I can be I can be sneaky here. I'm going to say that n squared. Hmm, sure. Sorry, you have to be a little bit. This is we're going to learn a different test that circumvents the need to do this. But for now, just let me show you. We can say that n squared is less than hmm, three to the n minus. That gonna work out again. I don't know. If that's work out. It might not work out so well. I might not be able to do it using the reference person test. Sometimes it doesn't work. I want to make it. No, it's not gonna work at all. Will it? Will it? No, I don't think it will. I want to say this and then be like that and that, but that just becomes one third. That doesn't help at all. No dice. Bummer. So yeah, direct comparison might not work. We need something else, which we're going to learn later. Yeah. Um, so here's what I'll say. Here's what's coming up. After direct comparison, limit comparison, and ratio tests are the things that come up. Um, and I guess limit comparison is technically not on the agenda, but most people cover it anyway, so we will cover it. Um, I will not be here Friday. I'm gonna, yeah, I got time tomorrow. I'll make a video tomorrow covering those two tests. That doesn't mean we can't talk about it again on Monday, but just so you have it all ready to see on Friday, I will make a video talking about the limit comparison test, which is a very nice test, one of my favorites, and the ratio test, which are kind of, in my opinion, the two kind of go-to tests to show if the series is converging or divergent. They're kind of my most used, if it's not just a nice P-series or, or a geometric series. All right, so I'll see you all on Monday, not Friday. I'll also post it in Canvas just so you don't accidentally forget and come on Friday. But um, yeah, see you all on Monday. You all have a test next Friday? Yeah. Cool, so see you. we'll talk more about series on Monday and then Wednesday we'll review Friday. And what time is your class on Friday? 10. So then Friday after class, We'll have class, but if you don't feel like coming, I get it because you'll just have to test. So don't feel like you, I mean, you never have to come really, but like if you don't feel like coming on Friday, I'll still be here. But if you don't want to come, I won't have my family.